Hey everyone, it's Dr. Nimani and Dr. Louie back again today with The Athlete Spine, and uh, we're really excited to have Dr. Neil Wright here, and, and Dr. Wright was actually my fellowship mentor back in the day, uh, now almost approaching a decade ago, which is which is kind of crazy to think about, uh, but Dr. Wright is in private practice at uh, Neurosurgery in St. Louis, and he's the former uh, endowed professor of neurosurgery at Washington University, St. Louis. And he is a, a surgeon that essentially exclusively focuses on the cervical spine. So Dr. Wright, welcome. Welcome to the, the show. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Dr. Namani, Dr. Louie. Thank you for the invitation of longtime uh, watcher, first time talker, I guess. So Cool, cool. And, and we thought we'd dive into a fun topic because, you know, we've <clears throat> sort of discussed disc replacements in the cervical spine in a lot of athletes because I think a lot of people are sort of have seen the news and are really interested in obviously the disc replacement versus the fusion. And so <clears throat> we've done a pretty good job of establishing, okay, right. The disc replacement is probably pretty safe in a lot of different athletes now and, and just people in general. But a lot of the questions we've been getting <clears throat> are focused on the mechanics, right? Because at this point, it's not like I'm going to get a disc replacement. Okay, do it. It's almost like shopping for a car where you're going to get a car, but what type of car are you going to get? And, and I thought it'd be fun given your experience to sort of dive into some of the nuances of how we make those decisions when it comes down to choosing the types of materials and the specifics of the implant itself. Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And I still get those questions now as a patient will ask about a specific device that they've seen on Facebook or, or through talking to other patients. And the question is, is there a device that is better than, than another? Is, it, is there one which is potentially better than an athlete? And I really think that question is, is, is not answered yet. Uh, there are different devices that, will, that have different features, whether they have axial compressibility, whether they have a keel, whether it's keelless, uh, whether it's constrained or semi-constrained. And you can dive into some of the engineering of those and, and there'll be some claims as one is from a, from a biomechanical point of view might be a better device. But when we look at the real world experience with arthroplasty really across the board, um, whether it's in athletes or in the, in the non-athletic uh, spine, um, I put myself in the non-athletic category <laughs> there. Um, they really seem to be fairly equivocal with maybe some minor exceptions that I think what it, to me, what boils down is what disc works well in that surgeon's hands. Because I would much rather have a surgeon put a disc that they're very comfortable with, that they have a good track record with. I'd rather they put that disc in an athlete than have them put a disc they've never put in before because of a you know, potential marketing or engineering feature of it. Yeah, because the, the the techniques are a little bit different, right? You know, the 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 lay public might not necessarily know this, but each of these disc replacements has has a slightly different technique of implantation. You know, the decompression is largely the same, but but actually putting the device in the right position, making sure it's perfectly centered, you know, understanding the nuances of sizing and whatnot, uh, you know, are a little bit different between between each implant, right? Correct. And then you, some of them are requiring you to drill keels, some of them don't. Some of the older generations, you actually use screws to insert them, which you know that's largely off the market now. Um, it's just uh, earlier generation. So there's definitely different techniques to do it. Um, and those de techniques, there's some pros and cons to each of the discs for those various techniques. So for for one um, device, if you uh, with a dome device, a semi-constrained, you have to leave that anterior lip of the vertebral body of the superior the inferior end plate of the superior body you have to leave that lip there because that's what provides the fixation the downside is that makes it a little bit harder to potentially see the decompression you're doing i think the advantage for that is it does provide some immediate stability for that device mm -hmm. and so i think it really then comes back to what's what's that surgeon's track record with that device uh, yeah. they're putting devices and not having failures that's the surgeon on the device i want to have yeah, and you've, you've mentioned a couple of key words a couple of times now, and a lot of people may not know what that means, but you said sort of a keel versus a non-keel or, you know, constrained or semi-constrained. Uh, what do those actually mean? Sure. So this re those are really referring to two different aspects of the disc. So one is how does the disc affix to the surrounding vertebral bodies? So some of the earlier devices, you would have a screw that actually screw the, the each end plate into the vertebral body. 
most now, now either have a keel or s some small type of keel. And that's basically a dorsal fin on the top of the, of the disc device. And you'll make a slot in the, with their drill, with a chisel into the vertebral body end plate. And that dorsal fin rests in that space to provide stability of the disc in the short term. Now the long term, pretty much all the discs have a roughened surface on the portion of the disc facing the vertebral body. It's usually very smooth facing the other end plate to allow the motion, but it's a roughened surface facing the vertebral body. And ultimately you want the bone, the patient's own bone to grow onto that sort of into those nooks and crannies and provide that long-term stability. Now, the question really is what provides that short-term stability? And that's where some of the keel, the keel devices come in. The other word of constrained or semi-constrained is really how does that disc move? Um, some have a ball and socket design. So um, the top part of the disc is nestled into a little valley and it, and it moves in that valley. Others have a, uh, a core, um, basically a, um, uh, essentially a ball in the middle of the disc in which the end plates rotate around. And again, I think there will be engineering claims of which one mimics the best human anatomic motion with the instant axis of, of rotation. I don't think that makes a lot of clinical relevance. Uh, there's not been any clinical evidence that one disc performs better in the patient in terms of replicating normal motion. Uh, it, it just, they all have different designs of how they function. Yeah, I, I often tell patients that, you know, are even with the disc replacements, they certainly move. They may not move exactly like the disc that you had, you know, your, your, your normal disc uh, used to move, you know, but certainly there is there is motion and they all move in slightly different ways. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think that for a recreational athlete that some of the nuances of, of a constrained disc versus a semi-constrained disc, because now some of our, especially some of our more sophisticated patients, you know, look up this, the, the, these words and they come in wanting very specific implants. Do you think for a recreational athlete, um, you know, we'll put aside kind of the professional, you know, hockey players or foot, you know, I don't think a football player has gotten this replacement that we know of, but do you think in a recreational athlete that these matter all that much? Short answer, no, I don't think they do. Um, because we have to remember what, why does the patient get success from the surgery? They're, their successful outcome is because you decompress their nerve. I mean, that's why we did the surgery. Mm -hmm. Now they did very well with the fusion. I mean, fusion worked really well for those patients, but the downside to fusion is we're increasing the, the de degeneration of the levels above and below. So what we put in at that time after we've decompressed the nerve, that patient's still gonna have a great outcome. It doesn't matter if it's a fusion, a constrained disc, a non-constrained disc, it, that doesn't matter. They're gonna do well. Really what we, you look, what I think about it is what's going to give them the best long-term outcome, either for the adjacent segment, right? that's why I do orthoplasty in the first place, but also what has in my hands, the lowest revision rate, that, that disc is going to do what I intended to do for the, for, you know, for the rest of their life. Yeah. And you bring up a really good point because I think that there's so much marketing that hits these patients from, from so many different sides. And it's, sort of like the glitz and the glamour of one disc replacement to another when you're exactly right. If you look at literature, they actually all perform pretty well, but not necessarily any different from each other. And some of the complications that we see are not necessarily unique to a single specific device. But if we look closely and we're honest about it, you know, we see similar complications and successes throughout all the different devices. Yeah, and but I think the public has to realize, and as surgeons are realizes, even though it's a very similar operation, I mean, there are quite a few nuanced differences. Oh yeah. I mean, if I work up my arthroplasty patients more thoroughly than I work up someone I'm going to do a fusion on, they'll all get flexion extension X-rays and really looking to see if there's any abnormal motion because the an artificial disc can maintain motion, but it cannot correct an abnormal motion to start with. So if someone has a hypermobility syndrome or if someone has a few millimeters of an anterior translation uh, with flexion extension, I wouldn't do an artificial disc in those patients because I can't fix that with a disc. Uh, those ones, I think, need a fusion. Um, and then during surgery, you have to be much more respectful of the end plates with an arthroplasty. Um, you have to balance your decompression of the nerves with how much of that pushier end plate or unsinner are you going to take 
you don't want to then potentially destabilize that level with the artificial disc. So, so it's yeah. Uh, you, one thing I tell patients all the time is that a uh, uh, a marginally well done ACDF beats a poorly done disc replacements any day of the week, you know, because a, a disc replacement, you have really have to get it perfect. You know, all these nuances really matter a lot. Um, whereas an ACDF, you know, once you, as long as you can get it to heal solidly, it's the, the patient's going to do well in the long term. And you mentioned earlier about, um, or might have been before we started recording, but I, I do unfortunately have a fairly large series of disc revisions of, you know, fortunately the vast majority were done by other people and I'm revising <laughs> them now. And the vast majority, I, I, I put those failures into two categories. It's either a failure of indication that they're putting that arthroplasty in someone who shouldn't have had it to start with because of an instability or severe facet disease, or more commonly, it's a failure of technique that they're putting in too large a disc, too small a disc, too tall a disc. Uh, and the patient's not tolerating that either with increased pain or they start to fail. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's the technique is critically important. Yeah. You know, I think one of the questions that we can sort of, as we bring this to a close that I'd love to get your input on is, you know, as you've been performing these disc replacements for a long time, I'm not saying you're old by any means. Um, you know, the, the indications that we originally saw for these ID trials are a little bit different from the indications that we're performing these disc replacements on now. And so what do you think is going to happen over the next five to 10 years in terms of how we indicate and start deciding, you know, oh, not only are these patients now candidates for a disc replacement, but, you know, with all these other, you know, factors that we can consider, how do you think these indications will continue to change? That's a great question. Um, so we, clearly the indications have been broadened since the initial IDE trials. Uh, now myelopathy, which in the first trials was an exclusion, that's now, as long as the myelopathy is contained to the level of the disk space and uh, you can decompress the cord, I, I think that's a, still a reasonable indication. Um, we, I'm now doing arthroplasty in people with more advanced spondylosis than I did initially. But you still want to make sure they don't have instability, they don't have significant facet pain. So we're starting to see it in more and more patients. I think where the indications still need to grow, and this is will require some support from industry to get there, is there's patients who previously have had a fusion who now have another level, um, and we want to do a hybrid surgery. Some insurance companies will let us do that. Some won't. That's technically an off-label, but I personally think that's a great indication. Um, there's patients who have more than two-level disease. Um, and, and potentially having a three-level arthroplasty, and some people doing four-level arthroplasties. Again, that's very rare in my hands, since I'm mainly seeing private insurances, and none of them would approve of that. Um, but I think that is where we're going to see some growth. And we'll probably see some mistakes there, too. We're probably going to see where we push the envelope too far uh, and recognize that there's patients who shouldn't have arthroplasty. They, so so I, we're still... I still think there's a lot of growth in understanding who should and should not have arthroplasty. I think we're, we're filling that run, we're filling up, we're getting a better concept of who does and doesn't, but I think that we still have more to learn there. I'm kind of chuckling as you, as you uh, rattle this off, because I, I just, you know, before we recorded this a couple hours ago, I met with a patient who, who traveled, you know, had been, you know, looking at, you know, talked to several surgeons and she has multi-level disease. You know, we had just had the discussion about a hybrid surgery, you know, why I wouldn't recommend treating three levels with a disc replacement and all of these questions. Cause these are, these are things that come up all the time. And, and yeah, you're right. That, that the, um, uh, our indications now have, have broadened and, and the research is still kind of catching up, you know, and then insurance companies are even further behind in terms of uh, allowing approval for what we think are, are surgeries that will benefit all of our patients. And we do have, one of the companies has launched a, um, uh, an FDA approved study on hybrid. So hopefully we'll have some answers for that in the coming year or two, uh, whether the insurance companies will start to approve that. Yeah, but I mean, so right now, if someone has a three-level disease and they really want arthroplasty, they don't want a three-level fusion. One of the options I have, which I don't think is ideal for the patients, we do a surgery where we do a two-level arthroplasty, knowing we're going to have to come back mm -hmm. you know, three mm -hmm. months, six months, a year later and do another level, now a fusion. Um, mm -hmm. 
some patients are happy with that, that they got away from a three level fusion, but I don't think it's right to bring that person back for a second surgery just to accommodate that lag in insurance approval for it. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. These are, these are all difficult issues that we struggle with. And, uh, you know, uh, it's, uh, I think, I think our practices will all look a lot different in the next five, you know, five to 10 years, especially as it comes come with respect to, to cervical arthroplasty. So, yeah. Well, uh, Dr. Wright, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, this has been really fantastic. I feel like this is a topic that we could probably go on and on for, for, for hours actually, you know, because there's so many different, uh, uh, avenues. So maybe we may just have to have you back, you know, to touch on uh, other aspects of this at some point. <laughs> I really appreciate the invitation. It's been a great conversation and I'd happily come back and talk about other aspects of arthroplasty. Awesome. Well, thanks again. Uh, again, yeah, this is uh, Dr. Mai, Dr. Louie here, Dr. Wright on the Athlete's Spine. Be sure to like and subscribe and follow us on Instagram. Take care, everyone. Good night.